All righty. Welcome back. I hope we've all had a good weekend. Hopefully yours has been less eventful than mine has. Uh, I just got power and internet back very, 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 very recently after yesterday's windstorm. Not that that matters. Uh, let's not distract you too much. As a reminder, your test to review is available in my math. I'm sorry, in Canvas. <laughs> and the test two is in my math lab. So it's been available for a little more than 24 hours now. You have until Friday the 17th. Please do not wait until 10 p.m. Friday the 17th to take your test because you never know when a windstorm will come and knock your power and or internet out. All right, so let's use that as a life lesson. On top of the chapter two homework being due on Thursday the 16th. And let's go ahead and pick up where we left off which was in 3.1. So we were still in 3.1. These quadratics, we learned how to graph them. We call them parabolas. We've heard these names before. Shouldn't have been any surprises with that stuff. Uh, someone just asked how many test units will we complete? Uh, we're gonna finish the first four chapters. I can't say that we're gonna be able to finish every section considering the fact that we missed an extra week of a 12 week, not a 16 week course, a 12 week course, which more feels like we've almost lost two. It's like a week and a half really. So it's gonna be very difficult. I've actually been kind of combing through my thoughts, trying to figure out which section or sections from chapter three I'm gonna skip, what I absolutely need to get done in chapter four. But we will cover the majority of the first four chapters. I don't expect to get anywhere past that. Uh, in terms of tests, I was expecting to do four tests and a final for chapter-based tests and a final. And I don't know that I'm gonna be testing for chapter three and four separately or both of them. I'm still working that out. So that's a good question that you'll get more information on very shortly. Okay. So again, 3.1 was on graphing these quadratics, which we very, 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 very lightly did in the last uh, chapter. But that was more of a sketch, if you remember me calling that, because we only plotted one point, we memorized a shape, and then that was pretty much it. We moved it left, right, up, or down. We reflected it, et cetera, et cetera. Then we said, all right, we want more accurate graphs for some of these things. So we took the minimum of three-point method for the quadratics, which meant the vertex and two other points. A lot of the problems, we ended up with four total points, and that was awesome. But as long as you have the vertex and two points, it is enough to make your graph. So we had our process for this. We did some examples. We reminded ourselves one or two things. Uh, where formulas came from for the H and the K. Some basic pictures of why it has to be a min or a max. Again, more examples. But let's move on to example four and five. Same section, 3.1. And these will be word problems, as you can clearly see. <laughs> so we want to minimize the product of two numbers who have a difference of 10. We wanna minimize the product of two numbers who have a difference of 10 or that have a difference of 10. I'm not worried about <laughs> particular possessiveness. English language is hard. Um, what I'm interested in is the analysis. So we want to minimize, which means to make as small as possible, the product of two numbers. So three and five. Three times five is 15 or one times two. One times two is two, well that's smaller. Or you could just take zero times anything, that's gonna make it as small as possible if it's positive. But anybody said it had to be positive, hand with nudge. But I also didn't say they could be zero and one or one and two or three and five because they have to have a difference of 10. So something like zero and 10 or one and 11 or two and 12 or three and 13. So we're supposed to minimize the product of a pair of numbers that have a difference of 10. So again, we're looking at numbers like zero and 10, or one and 11, or two and 12, or three and 13, or 20 and 30, or 101 and 111, et cetera. Now we don't wanna to have to go and multiply these, let's be honest, infinitely many pairs of numbers and find whichever one makes the smallest because we're never gonna do the job that way. We need to approach this in a more algebraic manner, in a more analytic manner. So instead of just calling these two numbers, let's just call them something like X and Y or N and M, whatever you like. So let's call number one X and number two Y. Now in chapter one, I kind of 
suggested we don't like taking an approach with multiple variables most of the time. And this is going to kind of start dipping our toes into that concept. So instead of just saying X and then something related to X, we're going to call it X and Y. Now we're supposed to minimize the product of these two numbers that have a difference of 10. Let's focus on the difference of 10 part first. If they have a difference of 10, that means one of the numbers minus the other is 10. It doesn't matter if you say the first minus the second or the second minus the first. It doesn't really matter. I'm gonna go second minus first. So minimize, I'm sorry, no minimizing. We're just going to write out that the numbers have a difference of 10. So again, we're only focusing on two numbers that have a difference of 10, where the numbers are X and Y. So you could write, and I'm gonna erase this in just a second, you could write X minus Y equals 10, or you can write, and this is the one I'm gonna keep, Y minus X equals 10. Now I have a particular reason I'm doing it this way. It doesn't actually matter, trust me. The X minus Y equals 10 will get us the same two answers in the end. Now that again was just this part. The two numbers have a difference of 10. There's another thing going on here though. This is actually the goal. The goal is to minimize the product of these two numbers. So again, this right here is the difference equaling 10. The product of the two numbers would be x times y. And I don't really need that dot there. I'm just trying to emphasize that it's the product of the two numbers. Now we need to minimize that product. So we want this number to be as small as possible, whatever the first number times the second, zero times 10 or one times 11 or two times 12. And you might think, oh, zero times 10. Spoilers, that's not the answer. Now we would normally do this. We would normally write f of x equals blah, 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 but there's an inherent issue. This is not a function of x, it's a function of x and y. So that notation is lacking. So the way this is actually supposed to look, I need a little more room. And it's not something that we focus on in pre-calc too much, but because there are x's and y's on the other side, we're supposed to write this, this is a function of x comma y because those are the two variables we can plug in. Y is no longer necessarily the output here. It's something we're plugging in. I'm not going to use this notation in pre-calc one. You'll see this in more advanced calculus. For now, let's just write F. Remember I said you don't have to show variable dependencies for functions. We demonstrated that back when we were adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing them. So let's just say our function is X times Y. And we want, to minimize this. We want the X times Y to make the smallest number possible. But it's really confusing having two variables for functions. We wanna try and make this just one. So this is the typical approach when you're given something like this. And in a calculus class, you'd call the Y minus X a secondary equation, the X times the Y a primary equation, because that's what we're trying to optimize. I'm not going to give you the fancy names officially in here, even though I just said them. You just have these two equations. We need to plug one of them into the other. And we want to plug in the thing without a function. It's best to plug in the thing we aren't, I can spell, I promise. That's half a lie. We aren't optimizing. Optimizing means to maximize or minimize. So what that says is we're gonna plug in this thing into that thing. And I'm gonna erase that red in just a second. Because I'm not gonna plug it into F. Where does it say F equals? It doesn't. I wanna plug in either the X or the Y, but the problem is this isn't solved for X or Y. So that's what we're gonna to have to do first. We need to solve this for X or Y. Doesn't matter. <clears throat> Hold on a second.
so I don't cough in your ear. It doesn't matter which one you solve for first. So we're going to take that y minus x equals 10. I think this is going to be easiest to solve it for y because I can just add x to both sides. And that'll give us that y is equal to 10 plus x or x plus 10. The order does not matter. I just swapped the order of the 10 and the x because it's addition. Now, this is what we're going to substitute in the place of y in the other equation. So in the primary, that name I said I really won't use a lot of, but in the thing we're trying to optimize, wherever you saw y, you can now turn that into an x plus 10. So wherever we saw y, we can now turn that into x plus 10. So our function, the thing we're trying to minimize, is now going to be x times and it's gonna be a binomial, so it needs to be in parentheses, x plus 10. We can clean this up. The x times the x and the x times the 10, we can distribute. We can give that x to the x and the 10. So f is now x squared, x times x is x squared, plus x times 10 is 10x. And this is in the format of something we know how to find the max or min of. It's a quadratic. Which we detailed previously on how to optimize, how to find the max or the min. We said if it's in vertex form, the, it's staring us in the face, but that's not what this is. If it's in the other form, what we called general form, the ax squared plus bx plus c, then we have to use a formula. And as a reminder, that very simple formula was negative b over 2a, that's the x-coordinate, and then you plug that in to get the y-coordinate. So, I don't know why I'm trying to use my mouse there. <laughs> Silly me. Our a is equal to 1 our b is equal to 10, and our c, that's the constant, which I don't see a number. If you don't see a number, it's zero. So h, the x-coordinate of the vertex, is negative b over 2a. That's negative 10 divided by 2 times 1. Now again, if you're asking yourself, why am I finding the vertex? Remember, the vertex is the location of the max or min. <clears throat> so that's negative 10 over 2, which is negative 5. Now, if you plug this in, I'm going to put a little asterisk next to this. K, if you plug in the negative 5, the f of negative 5, that becomes negative 5 squared plus 10 times negative 5, which is 25 minus 50 which is negative 25. If you think that the two numbers are negative five and negative 25, you're greatly mistaken because the point of the problem was they have a difference of 10. Negative five and negative 25 have a difference of 20. So what gives? How are the numbers not negative five and negative 25 if I've located the vertex? Remember that the H, this is an X value. This is an input. I don't want to write x, I want to write input. And the negative 25 is an output. In fact, this is the min. That's the minimum the product can be. The negative 5 is the first number. This is the first number. Going back above. We called our numbers x and y, and h relates to an x. So the first number is the x. Remember, h relates to the input variable. And that's why I like to solve this one for x. Otherwise, if you, if, sorry, that's why I'd solve this equation for y. 
if I'd done it the other way, we'd be dealing with whys now and it might confuse you, but it's still gonna get you the same answer no matter what. That's what's funny. Okay, so again, our first number was the negative five. How do we find the second number? Well, the second number relates right here. The y minus x is 10, or more specifically, y is x plus 10. So we're gonna plug this number We're gonna plug this negative five into this right here where there's an X to get the second number. Because we called the numbers X and Y, X, Y. We found the X value because that was the input for the, sorry, I'm, I'm hovering over the wrong thing. We found the X value. So that was the first number. The second number is just that one plus 10. So we get Y equals, negative five plus 10. Again, this is us plugging in the negative five into x plus 10, which is positive five. So this is our second number. So the answer, our numbers are negative five and positive five. That's not a coordinate pair. It's not negative five comma five in parentheses. I'm telling you that the two numbers that minimize the product but have a difference of 10 is negative five and five. And if you tried any other pair of numbers in the world, that product would always be larger. You might say, what about zero? Zero times 10 is zero. Yeah, but guess what? Negative 25 is smaller than zero. So this is actually a pretty common answer type where when you're minimizing a product of two numbers that have a difference, they, they kind of end up being symmetrical, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can have all these weird wacky algebraic statements instead of just saying the difference is 10. I could say the sum is 10. I could say three times the first, plus nine is the second, and you wouldn't get this nice symmetry. But again, the point of this was to be able to build our two equations, <clears throat> again, known as secondary and primary, primary being the thing that we're supposed to optimize. You plug the secondary into the primary, which we did here. You simplify it. You should hopefully end up with a quadratic. Otherwise, we won't know how to optimize it. Um, there's whole entire leagues of math devoted to optimization of non-quadratic functions. Um, and we won't get into any of that in here, but you will in calculus. And then we said, oh, if this is quadratic, let's just find the vertex because that's where the max or min would be. We found the input. We even found the output, even though I didn't need it. I didn't ask what the minimum output would be. But then we were very careful not to call these the pair of numbers. We said the negative five was the first because the second would be negative five plus 10. And that gave us our positive five. All right. So that's a fun little example. And I've got part of this next one typed up. I'll still make some little side notes because it's got that usual exponent issue with Word. <clears throat> So we plan on building a rectangular garden on the side of the house. If we have 120 feet of fence, what dimensions would maximize the area of the garden? And then what is the maximum area? So grocery stores suck right now. They don't always have everything. Maybe you don't wanna to go to grocery stores because coronavirus. So what you do is you plant a garden. But maybe you don't have that much space. So you need to optimize whatever it is you're going to do. You wanna have as much area as possible using as little bit of fencing as you can. So what we're trying to do here is we're on a budget, we can, we can afford 120 feet of fence, but we don't wanna build this garden arbitrarily. We wanna make sure we get the biggest area possible. Now to ensure that, first of all, what we can do is attach the, the garden to the side of the house because then we don't even have to put a fence along one of the sides. Let me zoom in a little so I have more working space. So here we go. Let's say our house Let's say this is our house over here. And then the fence that we'll build, we'll make some rectangle. Maybe it looks like this, maybe it's less wide, maybe it's maybe it's a square, I don't know. But what I'm saying here is the black part is going to be your fence. So this is fence, this is fence. This is fence. But we don't need to fence the side along the house because the house is going to act as a barrier. 
to keep our rodents out. Rabbits, squirrels, whatever vermin you got. So we had 120 feet of fence to be used along these three sides. And again, we're going to be able to build a bigger garden by putting the house as a fourth side. Now you might say, okay, well, why not? Maybe you got a house with a fence on the side of it, and then you only have to put two sides. Well, that's cool, but not the problem we're dealing with. <laughs> we're not going to assume there's extra fence. All right, uh, I got to actually peek at something to make sure I did. Okay, I called this the width this vertical distance, the width, and then the horizontal is the length. So let me just focus on this part. We call this the width, this the length, and then by properties of rectangles, this would have to be the length too. <clears throat> now, yes, the garden also has this side, that's the width attached to it. And it would be completely straight. I'm just trying to signify that something weird is going on there. But when you add up the fencing, you don't add up this fourth side. You just have to add these three sides. So a normal perimeter for a rectangle would have two lengths and two widths. But this perimeter only has two lengths and a single width. So the perimeter of this particular rectangle, this odd little shape, is just the length plus the length plus the width. Now, this relates to the 120 feet. We know how much fencing we have. It's 120 feet. And the length and the width, let's just call them L and W for simplicity. If you prefer X and Y, be my guest, but these are just a little more label specific. So the perimeter is 120 feet. So instead of writing P equals, we write 120 equals. Instead of writing length and length, let's write L plus L. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, hold on. And then instead of writing width, let's write a W. See, we've gone from using our words to using appropriate variables. This was part of something we talked about in an earlier chapter. We're setting up word problems. But L plus L, that's combinable. That gives us 120 equals 2L plus W. Now, this is not the thing that we're optimizing. We're not trying to maximize or minimize this because we know the exact value. We know it comes up to 120. We just got to find the right length and width to make it happen. And that more relates to maximizing the area of this garden. So now let's focus on what we call the primary, the thing that we will actually end up doing that vertex formula on. So the area of this rectangle How do we find the area of a rectangle? It's length times width. Or we could just write area equals L times W. This is the function that we're trying to optimize. And you can write A equals LW, or you can write F to make sure you're saying, hey, this is a function equals L times W. I don't care which way you do it because there's a little more going on. I'm going to use this one. The last problem was just, oh, two numbers, nice and boring, no actual application, right? Here we have an application. So I just need to remember that the function is the area. What might help you is the fact that there's three letters here and there's only two here. The primary probably has more letters in most scenarios. All right, and I said I had some typed up stuff here, but let's just keep it to this. Okay, so our equations, use the highlighter this time. We have the 120 equals 2L plus 2W, and I'm gonna use this one, the A equals L times W. We're supposed to plug one of these things into the other thing, but we can only do that after we solve. So if we look at this one, this is the equation that we need to solve for, either L or W. Personally, I would say that the W is gonna be easier to solve for because all you gotta do is move the 2L. <clears throat> if you solve for L, you gotta move the W and the two. So from the highlight stuff, let's take that 120 equals 2W, sorry, 2L plus W. And 
And let's solve it for W by subtracting 2L on both sides. And I got it under the 120, even though they're not like terms. Just don't try and combine them. That's 120 minus 2L equals W. <clears throat> this is that backup equation, that secondary equation, the one we have to use to simplify the primary. So now, <clears throat> in the area equation, wherever we see a W, we can take it and replace it with 120 minus 2L because we just said a W is 120 minus 2L. So let's go here. So that'll be A equals L times, now again, this is the replacement. Instead of writing W, we're writing 120 minus 2L. And it is at this point that things are starting to work out. We only want to have one dependent variable. We do not really know how to handle multiple variables. The A is not a variable here. That's the output. That's the function. The variables are the L's. I mean, A is still technically a variable, but it's not a deep, it's not an independent variable. It's dependent. So this looks very, very similar, believe it or not, to when we had here, when we had, when we plugged one function into the other and we had X times X plus 10. But this is not any special format. You need to get it in one of those special formats and getting something into the vertex format is a pain in the butt. So let's just get it to the general form by distributing the L, which will give us A equals 120L minus 2L squared, or A equals negative 2L squared plus 120L, putting it in a more appropriate form, putting the quadratic term first, then the linear term. It's not wrong in the previous format. This is better because it makes it easier to tell that the A is equal to negative two, the B is equal to 120, and the C is equal to zero. It's actually pretty common for these application problems to have a zero uh, of C. All right, so where do we go from here? We got to use the vertex formula. So I'm, I'm over here now. So we go H equals, that's the negative B over 2K. So negative 120 divided by 2A, which is two times negative two. Again, negative B over 2A. Well, two times two is four in the bottom, so that's negative 120 divided by negative four. The negatives will cancel. Four goes into 12 three times, so that's 30. So this is the first value. What did we just relate H to? H, the variable that we had before was L. So this is L. This is the L that would cause a maximum area. How do you find the W? Well, where did I have, there it is. <laughs> to find the W, we plug this in, the thing that says blah, 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 blah equals W, which is right here. So W should be 120 minus two times 30. That should be equal to W. Two times 30 is 60, so that's 120 minus 60, which is 60. That's our width. So the length is 30. It should just be L equals 30, but you get it. <laughs> and the width is 60. 60 and 30 what? I'm going to write the units in the end. Well, we were talking about feet, so these are 30 feet and 60 feet. So it's a 30 foot by 60 foot garden. 
those are the dimensions that would maximize the area. Now you might say, well, Mr. Beckner, how do you know it's a maximum? Maybe it's a minimum. Just finding a vertex means it's the highest or lowest point. How do you know that it's a maximum? We know it's a max based on the A. Since the A is negative, this means the graph points down. And therefore the vertex has to be a max. Boom, easy as that. But there is one final question to answer. They didn't just want to know what the dimensions are. We wanted to know what is the maximum area. Why do you care what the maximum area is? Well, you got to go by topsoil. You got to go by nutrients, whatever. So you don't want to run to the store, buy one bag of stuff. And then, I mean, it says on the bag how much, how much area it's supposed to cover. And then you get home and it only covers a third or a fourth of your garden. So if you know the area of your garden, you can then take that number to the store and go, oh, okay, I've got, I don't know, let's just say 100,000 square feet of a garden, big garden, and each bag will cover 1,000 square feet. That means you'd have to buy 100 bags. Well, we have a formula for the area. It's all of this, this negative 2L squared plus 122L. So you could plug the L into here and do your arithmetic, or the easy button, is the fact that the area is the length times the width. Why do you need to plug it into this complicated quadratic equation if you know the area of a rectangle is length times width? So that's just 30 times 60. Three times six is 18. Stack your zeros. Area is measured in square feet. So 1,800 square feet is your garden. So if a bag of topsoil covers 1,000 square feet, you'd have to buy two bags. I do not know off the top of my head what the average amount of area covered is for a bag of topsoil or anything like that. These are just spitballed numbers, so please don't take that too seriously. All I'm doing is giving a point. So let's pull back a little so you can see all this in its grand wonder. We had to describe the two equations, one for perimeter, one for area. The perimeter equation was a little different than just a regular old rectangle because there was a missing side. Now, not every problem has to be missing a side. I can change this problem and say two of the sides are missing. It could be one of the lengths and one of the widths. It could be both the widths. I could actually take some fencing and put in separations. Maybe this was an animal pen and you didn't want your chickens mixing in with your whatever else with your whatever else. And then that would actually add in some extra widths or some extra lengths because it's, again, not really a perimeter of a rectangle. We're just describing the sum of the fence length. Area was length times width. We took the perimeter equation. We solved it for one of the variables, the easier one. We plugged it into the area equation. We made it look quadratic. And then we did the vertex formula to find one of the length or width, plugged it into the W equals to find the width, multiplied them to get the area. One of my favorite style problems uh, in terms of an application uh, because it actually has a lot of applications and it also kind of segues into some very similar but a little different problems as well like uh, optimizing the volume of a boat to make a, make sure a boat floats as much as possible you can turn this into a basic problem uh, on a two-dimensional piece of paper arguably depending on the scale all right but that aside in case anybody needs to pause this later here's the typed up version of everything we did so when you're on YouTube, if you don't like my scribbles, there it is in type form with a little bit less of the work laid out. This L caret two, that means L squared. And you end up with the same values. Okay, so you can pause later for that if you need. That finishes 3.1, let's get into 3.2. Polynomial functions and their graphs. So in 3.1, we were dealing with quadratics. I'm gonna put something up here just for a minute. I'm actually gonna use the annotate. So in 3.1, wow, that was terrible. Back in 3.1, we were graphing parabolas, which meant they had to look like one of these two things, basically. In 3.2, we're gonna start graphing things that could look like this. 
They can have multiple bumps, multiple local extrema, whereas quadratics only have one and it's an either or scenario. So now we're graphing polynomials, which tend to look more like this. And they don't have to have one, two, three, four of these bumps. They could still only have one. They could have two. They could have 17. It's up to the problem. And we've got several little things that we need to talk about before we actually learn how to graph these. The first of which is going to be the leading coefficient test. I have the name at the bottom here, the leading coefficient test. This is going to be helpful for determining the end behavior. Uh, I'm pretty sure I hit highlighter. So we're trying to find the end behavior of a polynomial. And again, we call this the leading coefficient test. This is a lot of writing. It's a lot of little details. If this, then that. If this, then that. If this, if this, then that, really. And this is for a polynomial of the form. And I say seaboard. Let me just kind of squish it over here. f of x equals a sub n x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus data, 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 data. The next one would be a sub n minus 2 times x to the n minus 2, then a sub n minus 3 times x to the n minus 3. You just keep going until you get to a sub 2 x squared plus a sub one x plus a sub zero. This first term is what we call the leading term. This last term is the constant. The rest of the stuff in the middle is fairly arbitrary, arbitrary uh, initially, initially. So when I talk about this letter, I'm holding my pen upside down. When I talk about the letter n, I'm talking about the largest exponent of the function. That's all it means. n is the largest exponent of the function. As a reminder, n is the degree of a polynomial. It tells you what the largest exponent is out of all the different terms. It has a lot to tell you about the function. The first thing being right here, what happens at the ends? If the ends both go up, both go down, or in opposite directions, and specifically which? So the main two cases are if the leading exponent, if the degree of the polynomial is even, so if this is an x squared or an x to the fourth or an x to the sixth, whatever the largest exponent is, if it's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, et cetera. If that leading coefficient is positive, both ends point up. But if the leading coefficient is negative, both ends point down. So if the degree is even, both ends are going to point in the same direction. They either go both up or both down. So case A, trying to decide how much, I, how much room I need here. <laughs> uh, let me zoom in one level. So case A, you have no idea what happens in the majority of the graph. So imagine that I've got my axes drawn up, and this is the bulk of where the graph would be. But if that leading coefficient is positive, then both ends are going, oh, I can't do that. That's right, are going to point up. I got to squish this in. Sorry about that. Whereas with case B, you still have no idea necessarily what happens in the middle, but you do know that the end behavior, what happens at the ends, they're both gonna go down. That right there says so much more to me than all the words. If the, if the degree is even, if the leading coefficient's positive, then they're up, if it's down, I'm sorry, if it's negative, then they're down. I'm gonna relate that in a lot cleaner of a way after all this is done. Next case, so the second primary split up if the degree is odd. Well, if the leading coefficient is positive, the left end goes up and the right goes, I'm sorry, the left goes down and the right goes up. But if the leading coefficient is negative, it's flip-flop. The left goes up and the right goes down. 
So the A case, once again, we have no idea what happens for the bulk of the graph, but we know that the left side would be pointing down and the right side would be pointing up. Vice versa, if the leading coefficient's negative, we have no idea what happens in the middle, but we know that the left points up and the right points down. And we, again, we call this the leading coefficient test. So some people choose to memorize this big, if this, if this, that, if this, that, okay, or if this, if this, that, or if this, that. It's a lot. I never wanted to do it that way ever in my life. What I did is I related it to the graphs of x squared and x cubed. I relate this to the graphs of x squared and x cubed. So let me pull back some for a second. That's an important memo for a bit later. So x squared, that graph looks like this. Now that's if the leading term is positive. So that's a positive x squared. What if it was a negative x squared? That caused a reflection about the x-axis and it made both ends point down. If you ignore the center stuff, let me just scribble out. If I ignore all of this jazz, if I said, oh, okay, this is a box with a question mark. I have no idea what the, the middle part looks like. Look at that. It's an even exponent. It's a positive coefficient and it's the same thing as A. Both ends go up. Or this negative x squared, that we know both ends go down from the earlier chapter. Again, if I ignore all this center stuff, because it could be a more complicated function, it's not going to tell us what happens in the middle. But it tells us exactly what happens at the end. If the exponent's even and it's negative in the leading term, both ends point down. That's how I memorize this process. Okay, well, what about the second major case if the degree is odd? Let's relate that to x cubed. Oops, wrong color. Let's relate that to x cubed and, and negative x cubed, a reflection. x cubed we're supposed to have memorized that the left goes down and the right goes up. Negative x cubed reflects that. I don't know why I labeled that one when I didn't do the rest. I don't wanna to have too much up there. So the left goes up and the right goes down. Once again, ignore everything in the middle. Scribble, 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 scribble. Look at that. If the leading coefficient's positive, the left goes down and the right goes up, left down, right up. If the leading coefficient's negative, the left goes up, the right goes down. We don't know what happens in the middle. The left goes up, the right goes down. Those four pictures tell you everything about the leading coefficient test. In fact, they're going to tell us something else when we talk about the multiplicity of zeros. I'm going to come back to these four images. Technically, I only need two of them. I won't need the negative versions for that, but I'm gonna come back to these. I'm gonna give you big words, blah, 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 and then I'll give you pictures. If you like pictures, use the pictures. If you like words, use the words. Me, I like pictures. Paint by numbers. <laughs> so again, we call this the leading coefficient test. All right, uh, missing some examples. Where's my piece of paper with my examples? There it is, okay. <laughs> um, new share, I wanna go to the whiteboard. I need more space for this one. Text, this one, no, let's draw first. Example one. <laughs> it's fine that it's in green for now. Determine the end behavior. Of the following function. A will have f of x equals 13 x to the sixth minus 4 x to the third plus 21x squared minus 11. Okay, 
we're using the leading coefficient test. The leading coefficient test is based on the leading term. So we really only need to look at this term. I don't care what any of this other garbage is. Now I had to be careful. It's not always the first term, it's the term with the biggest exponent. So I was careful. Again, I don't need anything else, just the first term. Now, I don't want you to not see it, but again, mentally, <laughs> that's all gone. So we're looking at the 13 x to the sixth. The exponent is even. So that means they're both gonna go in the same direction. They're both going up or they're both going down. The 13 is positive. I don't care that 13 is odd. I care that the six is even or odd. The 13, I care if it's positive or negative. So since that's positive, that says, now again, I have, let me go with black, undo, undo. I have absolutely no clue what happens in this region. And I'm not putting any numbers. I'm not saying this is from negative five to five or negative one to one, or even from negative a million to positive a million. I'm just saying in the middle area, I don't know what's happening. But I do know that because it's an even exponent and positive coefficient based on the written rules, both ends go up. So if I want to draw a picture of this, this is how I draw the picture. But what you will generally see in my math lab, because you can't just draw in my math lab, <laughs> is that you're going to have to use what's known as arrow notation. So arrow notation is going to be critical for this. I don't think I had that on the other bit, did I? Let me double check. Okay, just double checking on something. So, undo. As x goes to positive or negative infinity, it's not going to be both of them, it's one or the other. Then you say y goes to positive or negative infinity. That's the arrow notation. It says, in simpler words, as you go left or right, you're going up or down. X is always left or right. Negative infinity would be left. Positive infinity would be right. Y's are always up or down. So positive up, negative down. That's what we're detailing there. So for this answer, this problem, the left is going up and the right is going up. So in other words, as we go left, this function's going up. So the actual answer, that was just the notation. As X goes to negative infinity, that's us saying as we go left, the Y goes up to positive infinity. That's what that means. As we go left, we go up, left, up, left, up. As X goes to negative infinity, that's moving left. Y goes to positive infinity, that's moving up. Then the right side, that's just the left side. That's only describing the left arrow. The right one, uh, there we go. The right one would be as we go right forever. So that's as X goes to positive infinity. And sometimes you'll put the positive sign there just to be specific, then the y goes to positive infinity. You generally don't actually write the positives. I'm just saying that some people write them down. That's why I didn't do it for the first, but I did for the second. I believe my math lab you are not supposed to, but it'll correct you if you are. So again, this was our arrow notation. This is us saying the same thing as the picture but in a way that we can actually answer in my math lab. If this was a handwritten test, which it normally would be, the picture would be perfect. But y'all are going to have to make sure that you master this error notation. I would let students use the error notation on a handwritten test as well. It would have been a choice. Now it's just not a choice. 
All right, let's do a couple more. Let's do f of x equals negative 20 x to the ninth plus 3x. This will be a smaller function, a lot less terms, but it doesn't really matter. Again, we call this the leading coefficient test because we only look at the leading term. This is the only term we care about because it's got the biggest exponent. Now that exponent is odd. And the leading coefficient is negative. And if you go back to the rules um, of what they say, uh, if, the, if the exponent's odd, that means they go in opposite directions. Negative leading coefficient means that the left goes up and the right goes down. And again, that's just from blatant memorization of the four specific cases. Honestly, I don't like doing it that way. What I do is I'll go to the side and I'll just write out what, since that's an odd exponent, let me write out what a negative x to the third graph would look like. The left goes up and the right goes down based on memorization. The x cubed, they go in opposite directions. Negative, you reflect it. I think I saw a question. If 20 had no exponent and the 3x had a 9, yes. So if I put the 9 as an exponent on the 3x term, then we would be looking at the 3x term. We are not always going to look at the very, very, very first term. Spoiler alert for another problem. Okay. So again, my head, I don't do the memorization of four cases explicitly. I just remember what an x squared and an x cubed graph look like. So negative x cubed, well, it would normally be left down, right up, but we're reflecting it. Well, hey, the left goes up and the right goes down. Literally the same thing that we would have said before. So if you want the picture, which is my preference by hand, once again, no idea what happens in the center region, but we do know that the left end goes up and the right end goes down. Where you attach this to the box does not matter. I could have drawn it down here. It'd be the same thing. But in arrow notation, which again, you'll have to actually use, you would say as we go left, which is x pointing at negative infinity, the y goes up to positive infinity. So this says left up. And then we say as x goes right, so x pointing at positive infinity, the y goes down to negative infinity. This right here, the thing I'm hovering over, that's not a negative right there. It's just the arrow and the infinity got squished together. In fact, I'm gonna rewrite the infinity for clarity. So again, the top one, the y is going up, so that's a positive infinity. The bottom one, the y is going down, so that's a negative infinity. Again, that top line reads left, up. The bottom line reads right, down. One more. Can I squish this in? F of x equals 4x to the fifth minus 11 x to the eighth. That is an eight plus six x squared minus five. Now this is where I would go, class, do you notice anything different about this problem? And I'd wait a second, and then I'd hope that someone points out that the leading term is not the first term. 4x to the fifth is not the leading term. It's the negative 11x to the eighth. That's the biggest exponent, so this is the leading term. It has an even exponent and a negative leading coefficient. So those are the conditions for the four individual written out steps. But again, I don't even like to use it, but okay, even exponent, that means they both point in the same direction. Negative means they both point down. So the left goes down and the right goes down. 
okay, there's your conclusion, but in blue, I'll show you the way I would actually do it. I would say, all right, negative 11 X to the eighth, let's relate that to negative X squared, an even exponent with a negative leading term. Well, X squared would point, both point up, so negative X squared both point down. So again, we don't really care what happens in this middle region, just at the ends point down. Okay, black. So if you wanted the picture, again, no freaking clue what happens in the middle, but both ends point down. So left and down, right and down. Or if you want the arrow notation like my math lab would want, as x goes left to negative infinity, the y goes down to negative infinity. That's left and down. Or as we go right, as x goes to positive infinity, that's right. Remember, x is left or right, y is up or down. The y also goes down to negative infinity. All right. So the error notation, you can use it. With the words, if this, then if this, then that, if this, if this, then that, if this, if this, then that, if this, if this, then that. Or you can relate them to two, honestly, two shapes you're supposed to memorize as well as their vertical reflections. Again, I just think that this is easier, but I'm giving you multiple methods so that you have a choice. Learn one or the other or both. Now, I do want to make a special memo, and this will be seen later. To use the leading coefficient test when a polynomial is factored, just consider the sum of the exponents of each factor. Let me show you what I mean there. So let's say you had, and we're not going to do the full-blown leading coefficient test. I just want to say, let's, let's have, I don't know, three parentheses x minus 2 to the fourth times x minus 5 to the sixth times x plus 1 uh, to the third. So to use the leading coefficient test on a polynomial that's factored, this is a polynomial that's factored because it's written as a product, 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 product. Consider the sum of the exponents of each factor. So what I'm saying here is that this is basically an x to the fourth. We can pretty much minus two, the minus five, the plus one, they're all ignorable when you're talking about the ends as you go to infinity and negative infinity. This thing is approximately just the three, then the x to the fourth, so I'm ignoring the minus two. I'll show you everything I'm ignoring. I'm ignoring all the pluses and minuses in the parentheses. That's what we're really doing here. So that's an x to the fourth, an x to the sixth, and an x to the third. So this would be three times x to the four plus six is 10, plus three is 13. This is the leading term. This is what you would use and then say, okay, it's odd, so they point in opposite directions. It's positive, so left goes down, right goes up. I lied. That's what the end behavior of this function would have to be. Just ignore all the pluses and minuses inside of parentheses is basically what I'm saying here. You really only need the variables and their exponents along with the leading coefficient. The zeros of a polynomial are found by setting the function equal to zero. We've done functions equal to zero before. We call them x-intercepts. X-intercepts were when the y was zero, when the function was zero. We spent a bunch of time doing that in graphing 
in 3.1. <clears throat> but now we have a possibly new name for it. I believe I've said it in class before. Zeros. Zeros are the same thing as y-intercepts. There's another name for them as well. They're roots. Zeros are the same thing as y-intercepts. I'm sorry, x-intercepts. Why did I say y-intercepts? A y-intercept is when the x value is zero. I said it right the first time though. Zeros are the same thing as x-intercepts. And they are the same thing as what some people will call roots. And there may or may not be other words for that as well. <clears throat> but those are the three that we use the most. So I'm going to start asking you to find zeros of a polynomial. Not really anything surprising. We've done that before. We just had functions that equal to zero and solve by factoring, quadratic formulas, all sorts of different methods. So we can go straight into this. We have done this before. There's nothing new about finding zeros. You just given a function, you change the function into equaling zero, and then you move on. Okay, so new page, example two. Let's go back to black. Find all zeros of the polynomial. And for A, we're going to have f of x equals x cubed minus 2x squared plus 4x minus 8. So we have our function, and we want to find its zeros, or I could have said find its roots, or I could have said find its x-intercepts. All three instructions would be literally the same thing, and what that tells you to do is make the function zero. <clears throat> now, this problem in particular is solvable by factoring. It's not always the case. There are many problems that have much, 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 much more advanced techniques required. Now in this section, everything's gonna be factorable for now. But what we are building to is ultimately finding the solutions to this type of equation without necessarily factoring, using kind of a, an amalgamation or combination of a couple of different methods of things. Some of it just kind of, hey, maybe it's this list of numbers and then we try them. And if one fails, we throw it away. If one works, then we're able to break down the problem even more. So we are setting up to be able to solve equations that aren't factorable. And you might say, well, why not use the quadratic formula? Because this is an X cubed, you can't use a quadratic formula on cubics. There is a cubic formula. Trust me, you don't want to see it. It's nightmare fuel. I there's also a quartic formula, but not a quintic or higher. And the quartic one is even worse. <laughs> All right, so for now, for now, for now, for now, just try factoring. Well, this is factorable. It's one, two, three, four terms. The only method of factoring I've given you for four terms is factor by grouping, and it's gonna work here. I wouldn't give you a problem that's four terms that won't factor by grouping in this course. There are four term polynomials that factor without grouping. We're not gonna go over that technique, or techniques, because there's several of them. I honestly don't remember most of them because they just don't ever get used. We do the thing I mentioned earlier instead. Okay, so GCF for the first pair. Again, we're breaking this up into two bits. We're thinking about the x cubed minus the two x squared, and then we're gonna think about the plus four x minus eight. The GCF between x cubed and negative two x squared is x squared. So I'm gonna pop out an x squared and open a parentheses. Let me make sure I bring everything else down, our zero and our equals. Now dividing that out, x cubed divided by x squared is x, and a minus. 2x squared divided by x squared is 2. If you don't trust me, distribute it, you get the same thing. Okay, then for the next pair, and I've mentioned previously that this middle sign is 99% of the time the sign you're supposed to take out. That's a plus. 4x and 8, the GCF between them is 4. Open a parentheses, divide. 4x divided by 4 is x. 
then minus eight divided by four is a minus two. And look at this, x minus two and x minus two, they match, wrong color, x minus two, x minus two, they match. So it's a GCF. So we write the GCF first in parentheses. Bring down the zero equals, of course. Then we open up another parentheses, and inside of that goes the stuff that's not the GCF. So when we take the x minus two from the first bit, you just see the x squared. Again, this x squared is what goes here. And then when we take the x minus two away from the blue bit, you're just left with the plus four. Again, you are taking these from the terms. It's, they're not canceling, I'm taking it from them because if you redistributed that green, you get the previous line, but please don't redistribute it. Okay, now this x squared plus four, if this was x squared minus four, you would be able to factor more. I'm putting a factor more question mark here though. Because x squared plus four, that's a sum of squares which means it's prime in real numbers. Notice I said prime in real numbers. We'll get to that later. So that means this is factored as much as possible. So we use the zero product rule. Set each factor equal to zero. So we'll set x minus two equal to zero. And we'll set x squared plus four equal to zero. The first one's pretty easy to solve. You're gonna add two to both sides, which is gonna give us x equals two. For the second one, well, we've got something squared, so we could isolate it and then apply the square root property. So let's subtract four on both sides, which will give us x squared equals negative four. And then at this point, we take the square root of both sides, dot, 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 question mark. Nope. We take the plus or minus square root of both sides. I can't tell you how many times I've had to say that plus or minus never goes away. So we take the square root of the x squared and a plus or minus square root. <laughs> that got ugly, didn't it? Let's try that again. Of the negative four. Which tells us that x equals. Now the square root of four is two. The square root of a negative is an i. So plus or minus two i. And those are our three solutions. Two, two i, and negative two i. You might have to separate them all with commas like so in my math lab. I believe you have to. I believe you can't use the plus or minus to represent two solutions, just so you know. So these are the three solutions to this polynomial. Now, there is a theorem, it's called the fundamental theorem of algebra, that the largest exponent is the most unique solutions you can have. Again, that's known as the fundamental theorem of algebra. It's nothing I'm gonna test you on or ask you specifically in the name of, but it's a really cool theorem because if I found four solutions, I would know I've goofed up because this says there can only be three solutions. Again, this exponent tells you the most unique solutions. I'm gonna make a little memo of that so that you actually write it down, hopefully. The degree, in other words, the largest exponent, is the most unique solutions possible. Not guaranteed, possible. And it's the word unique that is critical there because you can have what are known as repeated solutions, which we will get into. Okie dokie, let's do another one. F of x equals x to the fifth minus 20x to the third. Again, x to the fifth minus 20x to the third. So we're supposed to be finding the zeros, which means we set the whole function equal to zero. Easy first step.
and then we try and solve this by factoring. Once again, by the end of this chapter, these don't have to be factorable. For now, they are. You might say, oh, quadratic formula. Again, no, can't do that if there's an exponent bigger than a 2. Both of these are bigger than a 2. Definitely doesn't work. Well, fortunately, there's a GCF here. x to the fifth, x to the third. You can pop out an x cubed. That got ugly. It is insane how different this pen works on the whiteboard versus Word. I'm going to guess that there's some uh, computer algorithms that make my handwriting nicer in Word. <clears throat> so in the first term, x to the fifth divided by x cubed is x squared. It's just subtracting exponents. That's all it is. That's all it is. Five minus three is two. Minus 20, three minus three is zero, but we don't write x to the zero. We just don't write x at all. Now, x squared minus 20, you might say, oh, well, let's try, if this was x squared minus 16, that'd be x plus 4 times x minus 4. It'd be a difference of squares. We don't know the square root of 20, though. So this is not a difference of squares. Just like the x squared plus 4 was not a difference of squares. That was actually a sum of squares. This is just a difference of blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so we can't factor it anymore inherently. We go straight to the zero product rule. We set the x cubed equal to 0 and the x squared minus 20 equal to 0. This first one, x cubed equals 0, well, when we had x squared equal to a number, we took a plus or minus square root. But there's no plus or minus needed for a problem like this because the exponent's odd. We just take a regular old cube root of both sides. cube root of x cubed is x, the cube root is 0, 0, and that gives us one of the solutions. For x squared minus 20, again, this isn't factorable via traditional means, so we need to apply that square root property again. Let's kick the 20 over, so we add 20 to both sides, which will give us x squared is equal to 20. And then we take the plus or minus square root of both sides. It never goes away. You don't always use it, but it never goes away. Now, please note the square root of 20 is simplifiable. You must simplify that. My math lab will mark it wrong if you don't. So that square root of 20, that's plus or minus the square root of 4 times 5. Let me do my four in a different color. Because I'll be taking that one out. So that's plus or minus two square to five. So X equals plus or minus two square to five. Guess what? We only have three solutions. There were five possible though, but that's all that we can find via our traditional means. There are two more solutions. I'm not gonna tell you whether they're a repeated solution or whether there's something unique. Uh, it gets into a lot more complicated math, but for now, that's all that we can actually find until you go take a 400 level mathematics course called complex analysis. That's all we can find for now. All right. So again, I literally did no new math here. I just said, hey, find zeros. That means set the function equal to zero. No new math, just practicing old techniques because it's always good to practice them. Okie dokie. Back to the screen. This is a note we had earlier, so I can just take that out so you don't see it twice. Multiplicity of zeros. So I was alluding to this a few minutes ago, a few seconds ago as well. Sometimes a zero is seen more than once. So you might find that the solutions are x equals two and x equals three, but maybe x equals two happens more than once. How can we tell that? Based on the number of times it comes up in the function. It has to do 
with the exponents, typically speaking. So if a zero is repeated more than once, it has a multiplicity greater than one. So multiplicity is the word that we'll use to talk about how many times a zero occurs. Most zeros that we've seen in this course have only occurred once so far. But again, that's not to say they couldn't have occurred more than once. If the multiplicity of the polynomial zero is odd, so this is back to going even and odd, then the function will cross the x-axis at that point. If the multiplicity is even, then the function will bounce on the x-axis at that point. Crossing and bouncing, these are our two key words. Some people will use turning point instead of bouncing. I like bouncing cross. What do I mean with this? Well, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? So let's get a picture. So let's say this was our function and it has a single x-intercept. That's our x-intercept. Now that is crossing through the axis because it goes from below to above or from above to below. This is crossing the x-axis, which means that the multiplicity, which we denote with the letter M, I know it might be confusing, slope. It's not talking about slope. We're not really gonna talk about slope anymore in this course. So the multiplicity would have to be odd. In other words, that zero occurs one time or three times or five times. Whereas if you had a function that looked like this, this has one x-intercept, it's right here. Now I've tried to make sure that I drew this so it's sitting on the axis, it's just touching and going back. This is a bounce, which means that the multiplicity was even. The zero occurred two times or four times or six times or eight times. And again, this relates to the exponent in the factored form. This relates to the exponent in the factored form. The degree of a factor is the number of times the zero occurs. So if I just go back to this problem up here, and I'm not gonna actually do this as an example, but just kind of relating it to that. Because this x minus two is raised to the fourth, whatever the zero is that comes from the x minus two, there's four of them. Whatever zero comes from this x minus five, there's six of them. And whatever the zero that comes from x plus one, there would be three of them. That's how we can tell the multiplicity. In a factored form, it's the exponent of the factor that leads to a zero. So let's try this out. Again, even, bounce, odd, cross. Even, bounce, odd, cross. Even, bounce, odd, cross. I said that I was gonna relate those x squared and x cubed pictures before. Let's do it. So guess what the graph of x cubed looks like? It looks like this. And guess what happens right here? It crosses and its exponent is odd. Guess what the graph of x squared looks like? It's not a guess, you should know at this point. It looks like that. And I drew that kind of poorly. Let's make it sit proper. There we go. It has a single x-intercept. Guess what, the exponent's even. Guess what it's doing on that x-axis right there? It is bouncing. So let's try this out. Let's do an example and see what we got. Share whiteboard, new page, example three. Determine the behavior at each zero.
a, let's do a factored form. F of X equals X plus three in parentheses squared times X minus five times X plus four squared. So let's determine the end behavior of each of these zeros. So to determine the end behavior of each zero, we got to call them zeros. We got to set the function equal to zero. And this is already factored, so we can zero product rule this. We can set each factor equal to zero. So we're going to set the x minus 3 squared equal to 0. And I'm going to do this problem uh, just from here again in a few minutes. So that would be the first one. Then we have the x minus 5 equal to 0. I don't need its parentheses because it's not being squared. And the x plus 4 squared. I, I see. I, know, I just saw someone uh, ask a question. I know what they're going to say. <laughs> That's x plus 3. Am I right? I am right, good. So x plus three squared, the x minus five and x plus four squared. Okay, so for this first one, we're gonna have to take the plus or minus square root of both sides because you have something squared. And then the same thing for the third one. Let's write everything else. x plus three squared equals square root of zero x plus four squared, square root of zero. And we do that so the square roots and the squares all cancel. So this just says x plus three equals square root of zero, zero plus or minus zero is just zero. This is why I'm gonna come back and do this problem again. Taking the square root honestly does nothing. All you gotta do is just focus on the inside, the x plus three, that's a terrible looking three. There we go. And when you get x plus three equal to zero, we're gonna subtract three on both sides, which will tell us that x equals three, negative three. So that's one of the solutions. For the middle one, we're gonna add five to both sides, which gives us x equals five, which is another one of the solutions. And then we get x plus four, equals zero. Again, plus or minus square root of zero is zero. We're going to subtract four on both sides, which tells us x equals negative four. So there are our three unique solutions, but some of them are repeated. It's the ones that have exponents. This exponent right here and this exponent right here say that the thing that came from the plus three and the plus four have multiplicities of two. So now let's go and write the m's for all of these. m equals, m equals, m equals. Again, because this was a parentheses squared, the exponent is the multiplicity. So that's a multiplicity of two. That zero occurs twice. The x minus five did not have an exponent, so it's implied to be a one if you really need to see it. So its multiplicity is one. And the negative four that came from the plus four being squared with an exponent of two that says the multiplicity is two. Now guess what? We have not answered the question yet. I said to determine the behavior at each zero. What I mean is to say whether it bounces or crosses. Be careful. Oh, I see a negative three that's odd so it crosses. No, the multiplicity being even or odd tells you whether you bounce or cross. This is even. So we bounce for that first one. This is odd, one, so we cross. This is even, so we bounce. That's what I mean by write out the behavior.
So again, did I really have to do this square root stuff? No, what I'm saying is you can, when finding the actual zero, just focus inside your parentheses when finding zero. If I just look at the x plus three, if I set that equal to zero, subtract three on both sides, I still get negative three. The rest would be the same. So that's just gonna save you taking a square, a plus or minus square root or a cube root or a plus or minus fourth root or a fifth root of both sides. But you still need the exponent when you wanna talk about the multiplicity when it bounces or crosses. So let's do one more of those and we'll call it a day, B. And let's do another one that's factored just for emphasizing this. Two X to the fifth times X plus nine to the seventh times X minus one to the fourth. Now we're supposed to be finding the zeros and talking about whether they bounce or cross. So to find the zeros, we set the function equal to zero. Believe me, you would not want to have had to factor this. It would be awful. <laughs> and then we use our zero product rule. This is completely factored. So we'll go 2x to the fifth equals zero. We'll go x plus nine to the seventh equals zero. And we'll go x minus one to the fourth equals zero. But really, I don't need to worry about the exponents for these. I don't need to worry about the two either. The two, I mean, you divide both sides by two. Color, color, color. And that just gives you x to the fifth equals zero. Again, you can ignore the exponent that just says x equals zero. So that's our first solution. Let's go ahead and knock all of its details out at once. The solution is zero. If you took a fifth root of both sides, you'd get that. The exponent is five. So your multiplicity is five, which is odd. So we cross. For the middle one, the x plus nine and the seventh, I'm just gonna ignore the exponent part. Let's just focus on the x plus nine. Subtract nine on both sides. And we get x equals negative nine. So that's the solution. But how many times does it occur? Well, the multiplicity is the exponent. The exponent was seven, which is also odd. Again, it doesn't matter what the x is even or odd because they can be decimals and fractions and all sorts of weird stuff. It's the multiplicity that tells you how many times it occurs. So this zero occurs seven times, but it's odd. So the only thing we're really worried about is that it crosses the axis. And because we're gonna be graphing these next time, not these particular functions, but we're gonna learn how to use this to graph. For the last one, the X minus one of the fourth, let's just focus on the X minus one, add one to both sides. That gives us x equals one. But how many times does it occur? Well, the multiplicity is four because the exponent's four. That number is even, so it bounces. If you don't practice this stuff, it's gonna be really easy for you to go flipping coins on the even odd bounce cross stuff. It's really, really helpful. Again, the way I learned all this is that x squared looks like that. And x cubed, super quick, looks like that. This is a bounce and it's exponents even. This is crossing because we break through and its exponent was odd. These same two pictures helped us talk about the end behavior. It was only half of the end behavior because we needed the negative versions. We needed them flipped upside down, but still to get the negative versions, we use these. These two blue pictures right here give us all four end behaviors plus all the multiplicity bouncing crossing stuff. So I think those two pictures are extremely helpful and can tell you a lot of information about much more complicated graphs as we're going to see. 
So we don't have time to get in the next bit and uh, the three minutes we have remaining, four minutes we have remaining. So we'll go ahead and call it a day there. Uh, we'll be back up at 1.30 on Thursday. Um, please don't forget that the review and test for chapter two are available. Uh, focus on those for now, but the chapter three homework is available if you have time to work on that as well. Please do not wait to the last second to take the test unless something crazy with the weather happens again or other stuff. Besides that, have a good day. We'll see you on the internet Thursday.